Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to the Words and World series of London lectures delivered by the Royal Institute of Philosophy. It's a great pleasure to have with us this evening Professor Elizabeth Camp from Rutgers University. Prior to teaching at Rutgers, Liz was at the University of Pennsylvania and before that a member of the Harvard Society of Fellows. She's been pushing the boundaries of the philosophy of language in all sorts of interesting directions pretty much ever since she's been doing it. So it's a pleasure to have you with us. Her paper tonight will be entitled Stories and Selves. Liz. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor and, you know, I have a bit of trepidation. So today I'd like to talk to you about stories and selves. I guess I'm telling you a story about stories. Uh, and I guess that, you know, it'll be a, a tale of... Um, uh, a, a love story gone awry, but I don't think uh, it is a tragedy. So uh, hopefully, you know, bear with me through to the end. Okay, so uh, I think it's a, you know, a truth universally, uh, universally acknowledged that people love to tell stories. We love to tell stories, we love to consume stories. Uh, there's a sort of, uh, you know, John Niles has a book called Homo Narans, right? It's better to characterize us as P creatures of story than as creatures of knowledge. That is the thing that is our like differential, you know, essential characteristic. Um, we see us, you know, passionately in cult, you know, telling and retelling and consuming stories, you know, from ancient times to contemporary times across basically, I think, I believe all cultures, um, uh, across media, you know, verbal tales, oral and written, um, visual media, film, um, and not just in art or, you know, artifactual, like art like things, if you think that, you know, um, Homeric epics are not uh, are not truly art or something, but also in um, so not just in art, but also in everyday life, right? In the ways in which we get to know each other, uh, the ways in which we present ourselves to others, um, the ways in which we um, uh, make sense of ourselves uh, in engagement with others. It's just a pervasive, deep fact about humanity. Um, and so then the question is, well, why, right? What are we doing? Why are we so story focused? Why do we tell stories so much? Why is this such a passionate thing for us? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm going to, I agree. I think it's true that stories are essential human tools for understanding the world around us and our place in it. So there are two sort of strands I want to trace out here. One is this idea from Jerome Bruner. He says that stories are part of our armamentar armamentarium for dealing with surprise. So he says narrative is a recounting of human plans gone off track, expectations gone awry. It conventionalizes the common forms of human mishap into genres comedy, tragedy, romance, irony, or wherever format may lessen the sting of our fortuity. Stories reassert a kind of conventional wisdom about what can be expected, even or especially what can be expected to go wrong and what might be done to restore or cope with the situation. So I think that this idea of surprise, dealing with surprise, I think what Bruner, one way of repackaging what Bruner is saying here is that uh, stories are something we tell ourselves in time in order to be able to be prepared for next time, right? Either to make sense of a thing that just happened to us as of a type of a thing that can happen again so that we don't, uh, we de are ready to deal with it in an appropriate way next time, um, or just to, you know, uh, inherit uh, um, cultural tropes, cultural coins, as he sells el says elsewhere, for uh, dealing, being, just being prepared the first time we encounter something. But there's also something about our engagement with stories. We love to retell stories. It's not just that we tell the same story. We also like to, we, that we tell a story one time and learn from it. We love to recount the same story. Why is that? So here, I want to uh, say something about, it's not just that we have you know, a story in time and we're telling it going forward. We like to recount it even when we know the ending. So what is that about? 
So here I want to take a page from Louis Mink. He's talking about, he's, the title of this uh, article, this essay is called History and Fiction as Modes of Comprehension. So he's especially talking about history here. And he says what stories do is afford us a kind of comprehension. And, uh, as he says, um, why do stories bear repeating? The question I just posed. Because they aim at producing and strengthening the act of understanding in which actions and events, though represented as occurring in the order of time, can be surveyed as it were in a single glance, as bound together in an order of significance, a representation of the totem simul, simul which we can never more than partially achieve. In the configurational comprehension of a story which one has followed, the end is connected with the promise of the beginning, as well as the beginning with the promise of the end. And the necessity of the backward references cancels out, so to speak, the contingency of the forward references. Time is no longer the river which bears us along, but the river in aerial view, upstream and downstream in a single survey. So I think this is really powerful, and this is something I want to try to unpack what's happening here sort of through the course of uh, what will be a, a recurrent theme, a thread that will take us through the, um, the rest of the talk. So I think one thing here is there is this thing, we have a deep human need, a craving for comprehension, for this understanding, for just knowing how things are. And that is a kind of, I think as he says, it is a kind of yearning and an achieving to the extent that we do it of a kind of God's eye perspective, right? Stepping outside of the flux of things as they unfold to sort of make sense of, uh, yeah, to, to look down and to understand things in this more detached way. Um, and uh, so Mink in particular is interested in this con kind of configurational comprehension, a grasping together, comprehending, grasping together in a configuration. And he wants to draw attention to the way in which that's different from, say, categorization or generalization or causal laws in which you're just subsuming something under a general type. There's a kind of binding together here that's very, um, uh, in, that's a, a pays attention to things in their particularity rather than just as instances of a general kind. So I think that these two things from Bruner and Mink, dealing stories allow us to act in time. They give us templates for acting in time, and they give us a kind of understanding for un, uh, grasping events across time. That's a sort of guide, you know, touchstones I want to take with us. So to think about, I want to, you know, to bear down on that just a little bit more, I want to um, say, just try to just rehearse a couple of points about what is a story? What even is this kind of configural comprehension that would uh, guide us in action and allow us to be prepared to act? So this should all be, no, this should be especially controversial. There is, of course, a field of narratology, and people debate about this, but some just three sort of basic things about uh, narrative. Um, and I hope you hear some echoes uh, in Bruner and Mink of, of, of these points. So the classic thing that we all, you know, sort of you learn is, as Aristotle taught us, a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that can seem like totally obvious and trivial. But part of what's happening here is time. The world has no exactly beginning, middle, and end. You have to start in media race and you know leave off at some point. The world is still going on. So a story selects some swath of space time and possibility out of the vast you know, extent of the universe. And it unites it in a kind of structure of beginning, middle, and end. So what is that structure? What is that sort of arc of, uh, that unites a story, that pulls it together into a, a, a unity? Um, it's a, later events are necessitated or probili probabilified, they're made necessary or probable by things that happened earlier. So there's a binding of events across time uh, that they're bound together into this kind of structure. Okay, that sounds good, um, but is just anything, that, so, so far just like, you know, the exciting story of a billiard ball traveling across a table would give us a beginning, middle, and end connected in a way that has necessitation. That doesn't seem like it gets to the story aspect of it. So really it seems like an important part of narrative is we're dealing with agents. We're dealing with uh, 
I mean, typically people, because that's what, but an agent acting in pursuit of a goal, pursuing some kind of goal, a telos, as Aristotle says, um, uh, and facing you know, obstacles and marshalling resources along the way. That gives us that idea of an agent pursuing a telos gives us a reason for starting the story at the time we do and for ending it where we do, the achievement or the ultimate failure to achieve that telos. And it gives a sort of principle for selecting out and explaining which events are happening and why they're relevant, insofar as they contribute to fulfilling or uh, you know, failing to fulfill the goal. There's also, you want, I want you to hear here, in there's something specifically uh, about the idea of a telos and pursuing telos. So Aristotle talked about sort of uh, a, teleo a final cause, a teleological cause, has, as Mink as, as, uh, said, the promise of the end is in the beginning and the promise of the beginning is in the end. So a telos gives you a kind of backwards causation, people sometimes say. It's the goal at the end explains why you set out to do the thing you did, right? So you have to look forward to the end in order to explain why the agent set out in this path. So the causal explanation from time t1 to time t17 um, has to talk about what's most the goal at time t17 in order to see why to have an explanation of what's going through here. So that's that, that promise of the end in the beginning and the beginning in the end is part of what Mink is smuggling in here when he's talking about um, uh, what, what he's talking and that's, that's this teleological explanation. And then the last thing about that, just to layer on that, is it's not just a recounting of things that happen of an agent. Uh, it's we care about it, right? It's something that matters, and it matters. So there's an emotional engagement with a narrative, um, uh, and part of what. So one of the things people have debated about what is the connection that unites this structure, and is it enough? Just to, is it necessary or sufficient to have a causal explanation of the uh, connections in a story? And what David Velleman, more recently than these other people, has argued is that it's really part of the structure of a story is the structure of an emotional cadence. It's not just a causal explanation of pursuing a goal. It's that we care as the agent or on behalf of the agent or just as an audience about the pursuit of that goal. And so there's, um, you know, uh, he talks about uh, the idea from Frank Kermode of a tick-tock of like an opening part of an emotion and a closing part of an emotion. So you have hope and then the natural resolution of that is satisfaction or whatever, failure of satisfaction. What you have fear resolves into say loss or triumph. Uh, curiosity resolves into discovery and knowledge, right? So there's a kind of cadence, emotional cadence, that the story takes us through, um, and which is offered, it is present in virtue of this um, uh, emotional, uh, the emotional cadence follows from thinking about the agent pursuing this kind of goal, all right? So I take it that this like, three layers of uh, meaning that are coming, a beginning, middle, and end of an agent pursuing a goal and uh, the emotions that attend upon that, that's the, the core of narrative structure, okay? And that's what we're deploying, what we're using when we use stories, when we tell stories to make sense of the world around us and our place in it, okay? So far, I've just been talking about what narratives are and for understanding the world in general. There's a further line of story loving that people have sort of in, you know, pursued, which is that stories are not just important for understanding the world, but they are tools for indeed not just understanding, but constructing, making, constituting ourselves. So um, here are just, uh, you know, I, I think I might not read all of these uh, quotes. Uh, the first three I think are all, this is Joan Bruner again. Um, we create and recreate selfhood. Um, uh, Oliver Sacks says that without this kind of narrative autobiography, we're scooped out, desold, right? It's essential to being a person that one have a story. Um, Maria Schechtman, who's the prominent, most prominent defender of this kind of view, says a person creates his identity by forming a story. 
And then Alistair McIntyre gives her the fullest flourishing. It's not just that we understand ourselves. It's not even that we constitute ourselves. We give value to our lives. We make ourselves valuable and we determine what we should do in terms of a hero's journey, a quest, which sets a goal, which carries us through life. So he says, uh, the unity of a life is the unity of a narrative. To ask what's good for me, and therefore what should I do now, is to ask how best I might live out that unity. The only criteria for success or failure in a life as a whole are the criteria for sex, success or failure in a narrated or to be narrated quest. So I hope at this point that you feel, <laughs> I don't know, uneasy. I want you to both feel that there's something really right. We do use stories. We do use stories in order, indeed, in order to understand ourselves and to guide ourselves in making ourselves. But there's, there should be something, I mean, this is, this is quite strong, right? And um, uh, this idea of the value of selfhood is um, contingent on living that a life that brings a quest to fruition. That seems, okay. so I want to worry about that now. Um, I found it particularly cute that uh, the abbreviation, so um, <laughs> I don't even have to say it. Yeah. Um, so there's something really promising, something really right about what um, the narrative conception folks are saying, um, but there's also something I think really insidious, both, mm, both theoretically, in terms of a theoretical account, and in terms of its impact on our lives. And that's, it's really that latter thing that I want to draw attention to. Um, but let me just pause first with this sort of theoretical problem. So as Kierkegaard said, um, uh, uh, life must be understood backwards but live forwards. So we are living our lives at a time. And as Mink said, a story is structured in terms of the promise of the end. Right? And so you're always being, the story is always being toward the end, and the end defines what the meanings of the events are in the interim leading up to that end. And so there is no definition, there is no meaning, there is no identity for things as they un unfold until and in virtue of the end that is ultimately achieved or not achieved. Um, so Peter Brooks says, uh, he's a literary critic, um, he says, we read in anticipation of retrospection, right? This is, again, this sort of teleological structure. We're being toward the end as we're here at this moment of T, what did I say, 17? T6, we are, we've come some way and we're being toward that end, but we're not yet there. And uh, so a consequence of that is, as he says, all narrative may be in essence obituary in that the retrospective knowledge it seeks, understanding the totality in light of the relations between the beginning and the end, that's only available with the end, right? And uh, so the retrospective knowledge that it seeks, that narrative seeks, stands on the far side of the end, in human terms, on the far side of death. And the problem with this is that so we don't actually have understanding uh, until we achieve that end. And if you have this constitutive view, you don't even have meaning and you don't even have value until that end and in virtue of that end. Um, and the really sort of, and that seems kind of unrealistic. If the only criteria for success and failure in a life are the achievement of a quest, uh, then a lot hangs on the achieving of that quest, right? And as Ben Wheelis says, um, that big vague thing, that redemptive fulfillment is an illusion. A symphony has a climax, a poem builds to a burst of meaning, you might add here, a novel does. But we are unfinished business. No coming together of strands, the game is called because of darkness. So uh, just to carry that theme forward a little bit, um, I think that that's too, that, that grants too much power. We've seen that shows that too much power has been granted to narrative by these narrative conceptions of the self. I just, I submit to you that there are admirable lives and admirable selves that don't conform to the hero's journey. 
Um, there are, uh, so in particular, people with, contrary to what Oliver Sacks says, there are people with autism and with amnesia, people who do not tell stories of this kind, who not just like have a self, because remember this is supposed to constitute, this is supposed to make you have a self, um, they're not desold in this way. They, not just that they don't have, they do have selves, but they have admirable selves, selves that are valuable, selves that um, are distinctive and interesting, and, uh, but in the, even in the absence of a kind of narrative structure. Um, you might also think there are uh, people who are admirable, have admirable selves and lives in a more conventional way, but don't make for very good stories. So you might think of durable characters. I was thinking of like the village doctor, he sort of does the same thing over and over and over again, but it's really good and admirable, and, you know, but it's not interesting in terms of the quest and the story and the moving forward. Um, the other consequence is like, you gotta die at just the right time, you know? Like, if you fulfill the quest and then you keep on lingering on, like that's, you know, that's a bad life now and a bad self because it didn't make for a good story. Um, and then Galen Strawson has to draw attention to what he calls episodics, people who sort of inhabit moments, but there's no overarching unity. They, you know, are fully in a life at a moment, uh, or in a, an episode at a moment, but there's no overarching unity, um, and so there's no overarching self, there's no overarching value. That seems a bit strong. In stories, the narrative's telos, the goal that organizes structures, gives meaning to everything, is assigned from outside of the story itself. Right, so a paradigm here is Wordsworth is sort of milling around and he's going to school, he doesn't know what's going on, and then he discovers that nature anointed him to be a poet, right? He discovers what his destiny was it, that had been determined for him and he has to figure out how to implement and make that true, right? Um, or just the, narr the author just has determined that, you know, Anna Karenina is destined to, well, uh, spoiler, you know. Um, and so that's what, you know, that's the story that's going to unfold. Um, I was going to try not to say this, but, you know, super American reference. In Blues Brothers, uh, Jake and Elwood, you know, they discover they're on a mission from God. And so they've got to put on a bunch of concerts to get the nun or, you know, whatever. So that kind of, to, for the telos to have the kind of grip on us that organizes our lives and gives it sort of has to feel like it's coming from outside, right? Um, but, and, and for many people that is the case, but many people do not believe in a personal God or a personal nature or a personal sort of uh, some individual who has given them an individual meaning, right? Who has selected an individual identity for me. Um, but then if that's the case, then the question remains, the crucial question, the question we have to ask ourselves when we're, like the reason we turn to stories was what should I do? What is the meaning of my life? And if we're just getting the an a general answer, uh, we're not getting told the thing we were looking for. What about me? What should I do? What should I do now? Um, so that's a, a second class of worries. Um, a third class is even if I do have what I take to be an answer, that answer may be a delusion. So as Hume says, we are, and this is the thing that Velleman is really worried about, we are incredibly prone to project, to gild the world with our sentiments, our own sentiments. So to see in the world a teleological structure, oh, it's out there, it, uh, destiny has been set for me when really I'm the one who confabulated and made that up and decided it for me, right? Um, so that is an important, I, you know, so I think I am somebody, but maybe I'm nobody or maybe I'm something different than that. Um, and in particular, as Bruner emphasized at the beginning, I didn't give this full quote, but narratives give us, they give us templates to package our, as he says, in terms of genres, right? Comedy, tragedy, um, romance. Those are preset cultural coins that we have inherited. And so we, in virtue of telling these stories to ourselves, understanding ourselves in terms of these stories, we are constituting ourselves in the shape of those cultural coins. And in particular, if you are somebody growing up in the sort of, you know, um, semi-modern West, that encourages you to, to understand 
selfhood and the value of life in the terms that McIntyre did, in terms of a rom as a romantic hero, right? As, uh, you know, what do I say here? Um, to, we are, you, you know, if you're going to be any value at all, You've got to be a brave hero, you know, traversing the planes of possibility and, you know, with your sword, knocking out all the opponents and overcoming obstacles. Always becoming, always sort of being toward this end, but never actually being anything, right? Um, never actually just uh, being a true self. That uh, consigns many lives to uh, being valueless because they don't meet those standards. And so I'll return to that in a moment. So what do we do, right? And now I've, that's the part of, that's the love story gone sour. That's the, you know, like, you, you should break up with the, with the narratives. They're not good for you. Um, so how do you do that? What do you do? Are you doomed to be stuck in this abusive relationship? Um, so I didn't mean for it to be so sort of, you know, self helpy but, um, so to think about how we can navigate this, I want to turn to, I want to point out that, um, narratives are not the only kind of meaning making sort of templates. Um, so in particular narratives, this, th so, uh, Mink is right that we need configurational comprehension. But there are other ways to achieve configurational comprehension besides narrative. So in particular, narratives are just one species of frame. Uh, as I understand it, frames are representational devices that it crystallize and express perspectives into forms that we can kind of get a hold of, right? Into uh, shareable, stable shareable forms. Um, metaphors, um, uh, like Juliet is the sun, or, you know, our colleague is a bulldozer. Um, identity terms, uh, both, um, so I've thought about slurs. Um, Figley, for those of you who don't know, is first generation low income, um, uh, sort of a term for a certain class of group of college students, where it's been thought to be useful to for administrators and also for students themselves to understand themselves in those terms, because there's a common experience there where, you know, so slurs sort of label somebody in other, you know, as those others, but uh, the use of labeling can also be a powerful tool for self-understanding. Um, and then, you know, so other kinds of, uh, you know, labels like mom, uh, I've been thinking recently about nicknames, especially nickname, Trump's use of nicknames, which are very powerful frames. They give you, you know, it's not just, not just talking about somebody, it's giving you a whole way of thinking about them and an intuitive construal of who, um, who Hillary Clinton is, right? The reason he's always saying crooked Hillary is because um, it frames and gives you an intuitive construal of her. Um, and so those are all words, but we also have frames which are not linguistic. Um, uh, the thin blue line in the United States is a sort of potent frame for thinking about re police uh, relations between police and uh, the population. The police stand between or the thin blue line holding chaos from order. We also have frames which are those are all sort of, most of many of those that I just mentioned are sort of political and involve uh, sort of emotional reactions. We also use frames in more abstract contexts. So the mind, minds are computers, I take it as a frame for, uh, has been an extremely powerful and productive frame. Um, I think a metaphor, many people think not a metaphor for understanding, uh, you know, uh, the mind in the 20th century. So we have lots of kind of frames. These are some things that are really powerful. They're very useful. So I said that what frames do is they crystallize and express perspectives. What are perspectives? Well, I could spend a long time telling you about that. Basically, very quickly, what perspectives do are their intuitive dispositions to interpret the world, open-ended ways, like as you take in the world, to make sense of it in certain kinds of ways, to create configural, configurational comprehension, as Mink says. So what perspectives do is they parse the world into certain in terms that make sense and matter to us. So Thomas Nagel famously talked about what it's like to be a bat. And so the bat is parsing the world in terms of like opportunities to fly through windows and ways to, you know, get bugs. And so that 
way of parsing the world, what matters to the bat, the terms in which the bat meets the world, are partly a function of the sensory apparatus, but also a matter of what they care about and what they're motivated to do, right? So they parse, and Laurie Paul has talked about uh, transformational experiences and the way you can't understand, uh, there's a way in which you can't understand something on the, uh, for a tra uh, unless you've had a transformational experience, and she imagines trying to understand what it would be like to be a vampire, and your friends tell you it's great, but like, you know, um, uh, should you do it? Should you take the, you know, become a vampire? And so to the vampire, like, you know, necks are calling out for, you know, being bitten. And so there's a different set of priorities, a different set of goals, a different set of categories that are showing up intuitively in your thinking if you've got the vampire perspective. Um, so. Uh, so uh, perspectives parse, select out features in the world as mattering in terms that matter to the agent. Um, they make some information more salient, more like accessible to me. They hide other kinds of information. And finally, as Mink says, they configure, they, they, they uh, gestalt this complex body of uh, selected features into a coherent whole. Right? So with, armed with a perspective, I have an intuitive ability to meet the world in terms that matter to me, make sense of it, synthesize it into something that makes sense, and respond in commensurate terms. And so perspectives are really powerful and really important because they have that open-ended capacity and because so whatever aspect of the world I meet, I can sort of take it in and interpret it and make sense of it in those terms. Um, and because they're intuitive, so they're not sort of effortful rules that I have to apply in a step-by-step -step fashion. They're something that sort of automatically, effortlessly I engage. Um, and, uh, but that means they require actual implementation in my actual cognitive processes. And this is something that's partly but not entirely under my voluntary control. So for this, I like to use the old lady, young lady figure. So usually in a room this size, um, you know, there will be like maybe 10 people or so who can only see the figure one way and not the other. Um, I'm thinking these days more people have a hard time seeing the young lady. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, so typically you know, you believe, okay, can I ask? Okay, so how many people can see it both ways? How many people can only see it as an old lady? Great, so that was like five. How many people can only see it as a young lady? Woo! So this is a younger this audience skews young, so that was like 15 or something. So basically like a third of the audience can only see it one way. Um, and so uh, you said the people, that was, you could only see it as a young lady? That was, okay. So, and so typically, so you believe that you can see it, that it can be seen as an old lady, right? You believe that other people can do it. Um, but that's not enough to make it happen. You can try, but that's not enough to make it happen. I'm going to give you some pieces of information that'll probably make it happen, but no one piece of information is guaranteed. So uh, if you see the, uh, oh, take the young lady's um, necklace, that's the old lady's mouth. See, and then I love that sound, like, oh, you know. Um, take the uh, young lady's, like, really cute little nose. That's the old, a wart on the old lady's nose, right? So when it locks, and I'm not going to go further. We can do therapy on the remaining people later. But um, <laughs> so when it locks in, there's a phenomenology and a functionality of the gestalt locking. And you can do stuff that you couldn't do before. And you have an ability to navigate it. And if the figure were to change in certain kinds of ways, so the elements have a different significance. And if it were to change in certain ways, you would be able to handle that. But in other ways, not. Right? So the structure has changed in a way that changes the meaning of the, the parts and because they're being synthesized together in a different kind of way. Um, so that's something that's really powerful and interesting in this way in which it's partly but not entirely under voluntary control. But that also, that very, that intuitive, only partly voluntary feature also makes perspectives dangerous perspectives in general, dangerous in some of the ways we've seen that narratives, or we've already seen that narratives are dangerous. So they're self-perpetuating and self-justifying in ways that risk leading us into myopia and complacency. So myopia, we're, some, we're, we're blinkered, we're blinded. The very intuitiveness of perspectives, which is what allows us to seamlessly go around in the world, selecting things in terms that matter to us, 
also means that we don't see what we don't see. We don't see what doesn't matter to us. We're only able to see the things that matter to us because that's what we're focusing on. But that means that we're not, not even noticing what we're not even noticing. Um, uh, uh, and we feel, because we don't even know, we don't even see that we're missing anything, we feel complacent about it. We're like, yeah, I'm getting it all. I make sense of everything I see. We don't feel unsettled by our lack of knowledge about the things that we don't see. We also, uh, a perspective that enables us, it gives us a way to extrapolate patterns uh, and to impute explanations, in particular causal explanations, to various things that we see in the world. Um, and that's got to go beyond our evidence. As Hume says, all we encounter are con conjunctions of this thing has happened and then this thing happened. And then we decide that it's like a general conjunction. And then we project, oh, there's a causal explanation for that. And maybe it's written like deep into nature. Right? So we have this desire. A common case now is you know, we notice three women who are caring and competent. And we're like, oh, women are caring and competent, all of them, except for the couple exceptions. But really, women are disposed to be caring and competent. There must be some deep causal explanation for it. Oh, I know, women have a nature which leads them to be caring and competent, and that's why they should be parents and not, you know, hold, like, whatever, high administrative positions or whatever. So that's an instance of this kind of gilding or confabulating and projecting onto the world explanations that come from our intuitive patterns of thought. Um, okay, and then another thing, and just another instance of that, is that we engage in empathetic projection. I'm like, oh, I know what it's like to be, I, I, I feel you, I get what it's like, to, and then I'm really confident that I've got it right, right? So my ability to partly get somebody else's perspective, to take on and sort of understand things from their point of view, makes me think I'm really understanding them in their terms, but really I have just, I'm not, I have put myself in their shoes, rather than transforming myself into them, right? But the feeling that I've gotten it right makes me feel confident that I've really got it, right? And then that can lead me to ignore difference, be blind to differences in perspective and in identity that don't fit with my construal. Okay, so, so far I've just been talking about the risks of perspectives. If you add to that these frames, these like tangible touchstones, these sort of culture, that makes it sort of, that augments those risks. Because what frames do, they're both good, both the risks and the benefits, the benefits and the risks. So frames are really useful because I can just give you a really short little phrase. I can give you a word. I can give you a metaphor. I can fly a flag. And I can communicate an incredibly rich body of implicit assumptions and feelings and responses. That's a very powerful thing communicatively. And it's really useful. We need that. Um, but by that same token, because they have this, um, this sort of part, only partly voluntary feature, that means that my offering you a perspective can lure you into a perspective against your will. And that's, I think, part of what's happening when like, slurs are thrown at us. It's also part of what happens, I think, what Trump is doing with his use of nicknames. He knows that there are people who aren't going to like or going to want to resist that way of thinking about um, Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren, but he's molding them too. He's not just speaking to his choir, he's also molding even the people who want to resist into the patterns of thinking that he uh, prefers. So that's communicative risks and benefits of frames. And then cognitively, um, you know, frames are useful because they like, because they schematize and simplify perspectives. They give us like really simpler heuristics for navigating through the world, um, for, for guiding our intuitive uh, interpretation. But for that very reason, they it all might feel good and it might feel like it all makes sense. But that very schematization, that very, uh, may itself be a kind of seductively simplistic conspiracy theory. So one thing that's characteristic of people with a conspiracy theory is like, I, I didn't used to believe the earth was flat. And then all of a sudden, it, all the pieces fell into place, like QAnon, right? Like, it all made sense to me. A simple explanation made it all. And then people say afterwards, it was seductive. It made me feel like I, I had a lock on things. It made me feel like I understood, but it, things aren't that simple, right? It, you know. um, OK. And because frames have that comforting ability to like be, you know, you just you want to know what you should do in any circumstance? Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? 
You want to say, what should our policy be? Tell yourself, it's the economy, stupid, right? So having a simple mantra can be useful because it guides action in these kinds of ways. But for that very reason, it augments the risk of blinding yourself to changes in context and the things that you're leaving out that you might, you're not going to notice. They risk ossifying, sort of turning into hard stone um, interpretively. So now turning back, that was all about the risks and benefits of narratives, of, of uh, perspectives in general, and frames more particularly. Now let's go back to specifically the risks and benefits of narratives in particular. So as we saw, we need narratives to guide action and make our lives meaningful by giving us these kind of simple templates, right? By telling us, allow, telling us what we should be paying attention to, what matters in our lives, therefore what we should do now. Um, and that's essential. But by doing that, by that very token, the very thing that makes them useful is also the thing that for, it also is what makes them prisons. It forecloses other options for acting and for value. So it makes me think in a particular situation, I have to do this thing. The only option I have, after all, I've got my telos. I couldn't, you know, if I'm going to, my job is to fulfill this destiny or to make good on this uh, goal, the, therefore I must do this thing now, which will help to enact that. If things don't go according to plan, then there's a risk, then the stakes keep rising. Like, you know, I have to make the destiny come true. So I have to, all could still be redeemed if only I could do this thing. And then if you achieve a tipping point where it just is foreclosed, then there's, life can become, you have turned from a comedy to a tragedy, right? You're stuck with it um, because that is the narrative and it's come, you've gotten to time T12 and there's no more room to make, it's just not going to happen that you're going to get the goal by T17, right? So then you're a failure, as Marlon Brando's character says in, uh, on the waterfront, you know, I could have been a contender. Uh, I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am, let's face it, right? He's achieved a time at which it's no longer possible for him to achieve the goal that he thought it defined his whole structure of his life and therefore his self, and so he is a failure. And I think this is especially poignant and insidious when we think about people who have suffered a really deep trauma, a trauma that is like a really big thing, and that has the risk of, or then if they buy into the narrative, then they become a person who is the, you know, a rape victim or a, you know, person whose country has been taken away from whoever. That becomes a defining characteristic because of its place in the narrative, and then their life is held hostage to that understanding. So, Given that now, that's the really the darkest moment of the story. That's like, you know, so now what can we do about that? If we have that kind of uh, diagnosis of the perils of narrative, but also, um, you know, we know what these narratives are doing for us, what can we do about that? So I think combating this kind of imprisonment in the, uh, in the narrative which holds us hostage to the end that is the defining telos of the whole story, um, uh, the, the best antidote to that uh, is a, a, a cultivating a kind of perspectival flexibility, not being locked into the one narrative that is supposed to be the defining story of one's life and therefore determines who one is and whether one is valuable. Um, so here are three little you know, self-help things to tell you. Um, one, the story of your life has not yet been written, right? Um, so uh, either give up belief in a personal God or a personal nature, or revamp your understanding so that they permit this, you know, force permits you to write your, take a more active role in writing your story. Um, we do need to live life sort of as the characters in our unfolding story much of the time, but we can also step back and retell the same events in a different way, and we can step back even further and become authors, right? So rewrite the story, reprioritize, change the goals that organize the story, reprioritize the goals that we have had so that uh, we can pivot in different kinds of ways, so the different options for action are available. The second slightly more radical thing that we can do is drop this association, the definition, the constitutive connection between a self and a life. 
You are not your life. Your life is really important to you, but it's not the same thing as yourself. So selves, and this is what we saw earlier, selves can have meaning and, uh, can, and value just by being as well as by becoming, right? So it's not just in virtue of the promise of the end that they have meaning in uh, of the whole life. It's also what you are and how you act right now. Um, and uh, finally, as you might suspect, we should remember that narratives aren't the only kind of frame available for us in self-interpretation and self-constitution. All frames have these kinds of risks that I was talking about, but uh, other options maybe a little bit uh, allow us more of this kind of perspectival flexibility. So I'll just give you two of my favorites. Um, one is metaphor. So um, metaphors uh, also frame, the, as I said at the beginning, they frame our understanding of a topic, but they do it without this temporal teleological structure. They do it rather by giving us a lens which highlights certain features in the target, but in a way where we're both aware of the similarity and the difference between the frame and the target. So here, Sylvia Plath gives us nine, get it, nine um, metaphors for pregnancy, um, which are sort of disruptive and disorienting in their uh, variation, right? They're unsettling having any one understanding of what it is for her, and she wrote this while she was pregnant. It's unsettling having any one stable understanding of what it is to be pregnant, what she's going through. She's trying on a whole bunch, it's kaleidoscopic, right? She's trying on a whole bunch of understandings, and they, um, uh, and then trying to, I'm not sure that there's a stable understanding to be achieved over that, but there's a kind of, um, uh, uh, this kind of perspectival flexibility and um, uh, uh, multiplicity and awareness of the limitation of any one frame. A second kind of spe uh, species of frame that's, again, not narrative is the telling detail. Um, uh, Lucy, you are, I believe, the Volheim professor of philosophy, is that true? Uh, and I believe, I only really reflected just a couple days ago that Richard Volheim was my supervisor, and I believe that his, I believe that one of his most preferred ways of engaging with the world was through the telling detail. He would tell you a story about somebody. He was the kind of man who would leave an enormous tip and then go back and take it when no one was looking. <laughs> and so that told you something about the person who is being discussed, right? So a telling detail as an instance that exemplifies some broader pattern, but you have to extrapolate what that broader pattern is for it yourself, and there's, so there's no easy template for that extrapolation. So this is, I think, uh, something that happens with insinuation. This is one of my favorite examples from Trump. He says um, this, he's talking about Crimea. This was taken during the administration of Barack Hussein Obama, okay? And so he's just saying something that's true. Right? Barack Obama's middle name is Hussein. I defy you to deny that. What? But why is he saying it? And why is he saying it with that emphasis? Because he thinks it tells you a lot. It's exemplary of something broader. But he leaves it unstated what that would be. You draw your own conclusions. I'm just saying middle name. So that can also be used for less insidious kinds of uh, you know, communicative purposes and self-understanding purposes. Here is a, a haiku from Lee Gerga, and uh, I take it, so exploring the cave, my son's flashlight beam disappears ahead. So I take it that is a thing that, let's just say, happened. And it's exemplary of something that happens in parenting, right? And just saying it leaves to be extrapolated what that is in a broader way. So far, I've been talking about frames which are cultural templates and a bunch of these metaphors. Some of the metaphors are, you know, very novel, but some of them are inherited. Um, narratives have these inherited frames. As Bruner says, you know, we package ourselves, we understand ourselves and the world in terms of these cultural coins, right? And it's really important that we have and we exploit these kinds of cultural coins, whether they're these frames that are given to us by our cultures. Um, uh, Michael Tomasello argues that one of the most powerful aspects of human cognition is the cultural ratchet, our ability to create some kind of tool or some kind of interpretive 
mechanism and then hand it on to others to use. So we don't have to each invent things on our own over and over again using this uh, important intelligence. So we're not even, we're smart, but not even that smart. Part of what's really smart about it is, is our ability to build culture and transmit across, culture, across time in that way, across individuals. Um, so templates, cultural templates are super important. We see that happening with some of these other kinds of frames that are not necessarily narrative frames, but they're especially on display with narrative frames. But we can also, and we can make, okay, but we can also um, make frames that are, as Max Black says, not hand-me-downs, but are cut to order, right? So that's part of what Plath is doing. That's part of what Lee Gerga is doing, constructing your own individual frame. Um, beyond that, you can sort of work to step away from frames altogether. The thing that we learned, I think, from uh, sort of, I hope, from the putting together of Mink and Bruner, why we need stories and this narrative conception of the self, what we really need is a tool for sculpting ourselves, right, in this kind of structured way, achieving a configurational comprehension and constitution of the self. The narrative theorists are really a right about that. They're just wrong that narrative is the only way to do that. And so I've given you some alternative frames for doing that, but you could also try to do that without a frame altogether, right? So this is something that, um, so we could also try to create selves directly by reconfiguring, this should say, by reconfiguring our texture of being, as Iris Murdoch says. So Iris Murdoch talks about a texture of being is sort of a, a configuration of thought, a way of being that shows like in what people notice and don't notice, what they find funny, their patterns of speech and silence, what words they select, uh, even sort of how they stand and dress and address other people, this whole way of being. That's a texture of being. We can think about self-constitution in terms of like creating and modifying that kind of texture of being. So here I'm taking a page from Nietzsche, who in The Gay Science, he says, one thing is needful, to give style to one's character. That is a grand and a rare art. One surveys all that his nature presents in its strength and in its weaknesses, and then fashions it into an ingenious plan until everything appears artistic and rational, and even the weaknesses enchant the eye. Here, there has been a great amount of second nature added. There, a portion of first nature has been taken away, in both cases with long exercise and daily labor at the task. Here, the ugly has been concealed. There, it has been reinterpreted into the sublime. Much of the vague, which refuses to take form, has been reserved and utilized for their perspectives. Uh, it is meant to give a hint of the remote and the immeasurable. In the end, when the work has been completed, it is revealed how it was the constraint of the same taste that organized and fashioned it in whole or in part. Whether the taste was good or bad is of less importance than one thinks. It is sufficient that it was a taste. So I want to there, I, don't, I want to sort of downplay play the like Nietzsche, what really matters is, you know, will to selfhood. It doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. We can, I think we can sort of put that to the side. What's really important here is um, that he, like the narrative uh, theorists, is saying we, there is something about self-making, and self-making which is aesthetic, it is the building of a structure, and uh, one where we can take inspiration from what artists do uh, in the way in which they create complex structures that bind things together into very uh, multi-dimensional complexes that subsume many parts, just like a narrative does. But it need not be a narrative, right? Uh, it can be something that we construct ourselves in our own sort of very highly particular terms. Okay, so where have we been? Where do I, what do I hope you take away? Um, so I think we do need stories. We need stories to guide action and to comprehend our lives. Bruner and Mink are, you know, right about that. But stories have this specifically temporal and teleological structure. And that structure, that specific kind of structure, holds uh, selves hostage to the ends. So if you're thinking of selfhood in terms of narratives, then you're holding hostage to the end, um, the, the lives, the end of the lives of, the, of those selves. Other kinds of frames exist and also allow us to achieve perspectives, right? To parse, select, and synthesize the traits that we have and the events that happen to us 
um, into into intuitive holistic structures, just like narratives do. Um, but some of them, these alternative kinds of species of frame, um, may offer more kind of more of this interpretive flexibility, um, and thereby have a better run at combating the kind of myopia and complacency and ossification that is a risk for all frames. What's really needful is that we achieve agency with respect to our given traits in history, that we not just sort of like have a pile of features and things happening to us, but that we make that into a self in some way. Um, that we mold ourselves into coherent, valuable wholes, whose unit, where the unity in question may be deeply subtle and complex. It need not be a very straightforward, sort of certainly logical consistency. Um, it can be a really, as Nietzsche emphasizes, a very complex, interesting, aesthetically um, uh, remarkable and highly particular kind of unity. This is a, a painting called Golden Splendor by Hans Hoffmann, who was one of Richard Fulheim's fav favorite um, artists. And I think it has a kind of really interesting unity and coherence, though not in any obvious kind of way, right? Um, and so unlike life stories, the personae, the sort of ways of being the selves that we build, can be, and they can be rebuilt at any moment. Um, and, our, and I want to suggest that the primary locus of agency, what makes us us and where we are agents, where we act, is less in the terms that McIntyre suggested of like being a hero, questing after the grand uh, destiny, and more in the sort of small everyday moments, the ways in which we uh, amplify and mold our texture of being uh, as we move forward. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, over to you for questions. I was wondering about, uh, when you think about the idea of like individuation, so that's how I understand the idea of the hero's journey, like becoming a self. So can we understand the hero's journey more uh, of this journey of, of actually becoming ourselves rather than achieving some ultimate quest or end? So one might think that the goal is to become a self. That that is the telos. Uh, and that is what individuation is, is the becoming of an individual, and that is something that is achieved. You know. But that has the same, and so that's different from like getting the golden ring or slaying the dragon or becoming president or whatever, right? Um, but it has that same structure of it's only redeemed and only enacted in virtue of the end. And once you've done it, like then what? Probably right. it wouldn't really be achievable like an end, right? You can't like I'm myself now. So it's kind of a continuous process. So then so now I think we have a sort of um, sort of choice point. Either we're moving away from a narrative conception um, and thinking just about, you know, yes, becoming, individuating. And then I think a lot of the things I was saying as now we've freed ourselves of the narrative shackles and you can take on board some of the things that I was saying. Or else you're like, no, it's really narrative, and the telos is to become a being, to become a true self. And then I think we have many of the criticisms that I was uh, saying. Is that? <laughs> also, I just want to add one more thing, which is just like, and you also probably want to leave open that like, it's, the task is not just to become like some individual, but an individual who has valuable values, right? So, for instance, Susan Wolf talks about somebody who's like just really, really, really focused on counting blades of grass, you know? So, like, they're like, that's me. That's, that's who I am, you know? Like, maybe they've really become an individual, but, like, maybe that's not really the achievement of, that's not a valuable value, right? So you might want to go for making yourself an individual as the only telos. There still seems like the value of the goal might be on that. Um. I'm interested in stories of different cross cultures and uh, less of a focus on an individual and maybe more on a community and what people learn. Yeah, yeah, good. So, uh, yes, that's right. Um, the, 
So as, and I didn't give you, there's this other quote from Bruner where he's emphasizing more the cultural contingency and the cultural coins, the particular, and, and so I tried to say, you know, in our culture, which especially has this heroic, uh, epic uh, sort of, you know, history, um, that is especially leads us to confabulate the hero's journey and uh, in those kinds of terms, and I think you see that in the McIntyre quote. Um, but I still think that those even, um, so I think narratives which prioritize uh, the individual's selfhood in terms of their place in a broader communal role still have this structure, right? And so still, I mean, yes, the people are gonna make sense of and be selves in different ways in different cultures, right? And that's, and one of the things that can be really useful in trying to figure out who you are and who you wanna be is to look at a variety of kinds of stories and, um, but, the get, and, that, and that can be a way of breaking some of this risk of ossification, that, like there's only one kind of way of telling a story, right? And so to that extent, that can help to be an antidote, like seeing that stories can have multiple kinds of structure, um, or sorry, multiple kinds of character um, uh, can be an antidote, but um, it still has, you know, if, insofar as it's got this narrative structure, then you know, it's inheriting that teleological thing that I'm worried about. Okay, right at the back, Nick. So I found that like a really perspective, um, a good example of perspective in that there's this thing that's constraining us that we don't even realize is there. Yeah. Like that. So that, that seemed a very powerful way of capturing the role of narrative in structured cells. But I was wondering why it's the shift away from narrative that solves the problem, yes, there is. Because you already gave us a way of solving the problem, yeah. which was realizing that we, we can tell multiple narratives, we yeah. keep retelling, yeah. and that seems to mitigate the risk. Um, on the other hand, other frames also have a risk. I mean, even the sexual one, the, yeah. the coming out of my style, it might yeah. suddenly something happens so that I can no longer feed things into this yeah. kind of style. Yeah. So it seems like the, the other frames and the non-framing run a similar like, yeah. temporal profile risk. Yeah. So I wonder why ah. moving away from the narrative to other frames or non-framing is supposed to mitigate the like, Great, okay. The so, right, so I didn't wanna, I mean, I, right, I tried to offer like a three-part, you know, like a, a, a range of recipe of techniques. One was like handle narratives themselves in different kinds of ways. Second was use fra other kinds of frames. And the third is try not to use frames, you know, at all. Um, I mean, I guess there is one thing that's just like we do live in time. Right, um, and so in that sense, like, and action is essentially teleological. Like, action is goal directed. Right, so there's a way in which narratives are unavoidable um, because there are these two features of our lives. Like, insofar as we're agents, we're acting in time to achieve goals. But so I think the thing that I really worry about is the totalizing, the conflation of the self and the life. And the idea that there's a story, um, as opposed to like multiple stories that, you know. Um, uh, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I guess I also think that, maybe I think that, uh, that this goes, there's, it, the, the very indulgence of like focusing just on narrative and not understanding there's just one genus, or just one species in the genus, um, makes us all about being agents. And we are agents, but we're also just, and, and so in that sense, I, I, I do want to have this like, we're not just becoming, we're being. You know, like just there's something about just like, you know, do, just being here now as the thing you are and not acting forward. That's something I think we should do more to pay attention to. So that's not really about temporal risk, that's about this mischaracterizing the value of life. Well, but there's also a way in which, um, but I think there is something about, it's not just like, I just, I don't wanna, f I don't wanna, f I guess when people talk about being as opposed to becoming, there's a way in which it's like, dissolving the boundaries of the self and just moving into a kind of like, just be here now. And I wanna retain a sense of like, me, in my individuality, 
you know, uh, being here now without like being toward going forward. Um, so that's the, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, Murray. Great, thank you. Thanks for a terrific talk on this. Um, I guess I wanted to press a bit further on part three. Yeah, so I completely the have, well, the specifically the idea of framelessness. Yeah, I'm sure you use quite yeah. that word. But yeah. That was the idea. So I completely get part one. I completely understand that moving among frames okay, is go. an important yeah. uh, virtue and, and uh, sort of part of the cure for the problem that is part one. Um, I guess one way of putting the question would be, when you talk about texture of being, is it really just another cut, uh, a very fine grain type ah, of frame? Good. Is it really stepping outside yeah. the frame altogether? Yeah. Uh, framing altogether? Yeah. Um, and I guess a further question then would be, if we're really stepping outside of a frame authentically, is well, I guess you were hinting at this in terms of whether you just characterize conventional ways of understanding being as distinct from becoming. Yeah. In other words, it's like the self is dissolved, the self, at least in its kind of traditional Western conception, right, right. is dissolved, dissolving into kind of impulses, fragments, and maybe there's a place for that. But I'm not sure that that's quite what that's the not what I want. Yeah, that's felt not like. right. exactly. it felt more like I want it to be this a fine-grained, yes. highly specific, yeah. non-generic yeah. frame rather than a yeah. non-frame. Great. So I think that there is a bit of a, like a annoying technical answer to your question, oh, which is, <laughs> um, as I have defined the term frame, it is a representational device, the kind of thing that can be like you know, could be an external sentence or a flag or a whatever. It's a representational device that expresses a perspective, right? And so um, it is, and, and not, like we can, so we can have, I'm not saying that we would step outside of perspectives altogether, right? I'm saying you can like achieve a, and I think that we do this like, um, uh, I might have my own, just my, my poor son who's 14 is working on his own distinctive political perspective and he doesn't have a particular frame for it, right? Um, there's one of the reasons we make art is to try to create frames to express perspectives that are already sort of, you know, present, they're inchoate, but whatever, right? So uh, what I mean by a frameless self-construction is without a kind of that kind of touchstone guiding external thing like a mantra, that then provides a schema for doing the interpretation, but that like, like is in its full particularity and you know individuality and whatever, it has all the nuances. So, so that makes a lot of sense, but presumably even the, you know, the full monty, the fully realized yeah. texture of being, being ideal you've got there, it's not gonna be entirely free of drawing on framing resources. Totally, so, yeah. No. It's I mean, I am a creature of an inheritor yeah. of my, you know, yeah. It's just kind of, it's in yeah. charge. It's just there words. is no one frame yeah. that is the thing that, you know, whatever I use it to. Okay, now I see you. There was one more question over that side that I want to take next. Who was it? Who had that? Yeah, go for it, and then I'll come to you. So two very brief questions that follow from each other. The first, so whether we should by the idea that narratives do have uh, an end structure uh, that allows this kind of uh, retrospective explanation, mm -hmm. retrospective knowledge. So for example, you're mentioning something like conspiracy theories. So we can think about the narratives there as expressing a certain kind of perspective that pulls on uh, some information as being slightly central, uh, some information more accessible, mm -hmm. except all the things that are in perspective. But in this case, I find it hard to see what is the end in light of which um, these kind of events are explained. And what follows from this is maybe, it's not that kind of the cognitive uh, apparatus of stories and narratives that is going bad, but is some of these stories are bad because they're epistemic. Something has gone wrong on the epistemic exactly. side and not on the cognitive side. <coughs> um, yeah. so, so totally. Um, so a quibbly kind of thing about the first question, um, so you said conspiracy theory, like that's not a conspiracy story, right? So I guess what I'm thinking is in a conspiracy theory, 
I mean, we'd have to talk about like a particular case, right? But like, um, so, and I, I fear that I don't know enough details, like my knowledge of any particular case is gonna be so woefully partial that I'm not gonna wanna stand up here and admit that I don't, you know. But so, uh, I take it like a certain kind of, there's a, either there's a certain like an overarching conspiracy theory about like the shadowy dark forces that are regulating, doing all this behind the scenes, and then that's gonna, that's like a standing set of assumptions about what's really going on behind the scenes, and then that's gonna generate narratives for explaining particular sequence of those events, which will have like a certain, that will, will have narrative structure. Um, so either, I'm, I'm gonna say either it has narrative structure or it's just a conspiracy theory, which is like a background theory, which doesn't have a teleological structure. I'm totally with you, but it's not, or not for that reason, not a narrative, right? So, uh, Okay, so that's, but, and maybe we can fight it. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be that, I do think there's something about um, narrative structure. Like, I, you know, so there's, there's narratives, there's also like the telling of the story, which is different from the actual narrative structure, right? So we reveal things in telling a story out of, I mean, so there's a lot of complexity there. I think that the sketch I gave about what a narrative is, is gets at something and we should hold on to that even where there's complexities, but I don't really want to fight about like the details of what exactly a narrative is. Okay, so, but, but we could have that conversation more and that could be exciting. But, um, okay, the second thing is, yes, so it's super important. Um, so I focus on the communicative and the cognitive like risks and benefits. Um, I take it that the, co and, and I was talking about the cognitive benefits in terms of, because I was talking about this self-constitution thing, about like their impact on like how we interpret ourselves, and it might be that there's less of a fact of the matter there about, because I'm making myself as I'm, but um, one, I mean, but we use perspectives to understand the world. I think that we use them in, you know, politics, religion, science, whatever, right? And so, um, in, even in the case of self, the self, understanding the self, but also more obviously these other cases, like there's epistemic assessment to be done. Um, and then there's a whole question, like do you think that it reduces to just assessment of this in the standard terms about knowledge and propositions and reliable access to propositions, or is there some distinctive norms of uh, perspectival assessment, epistemic, and I do think there are such norms, and I'm like, you know, so if you wanna like come join my team and we can, you know, um, you know, make that case, I would love that. But, uh, so I'm definitely on board with the thought that there's epistemic uh, assessment here, which can be distinct from how cognitively useful or, you know, sort of, yeah. Yes. And especially because I, I got that she didn't want to say that the uh, evaluative, epistemic evaluative norms in these cases would be reduced to the kind of standard, familiar, you know, evidentialist norms. Right, that would seem like, like a, right, that's, yeah. yeah, that seems like a narrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor. I kind of find it very intriguing uh, and uh, insightful about your like, connecting narratives with the self-constructive uh, constructive thing. Uh, I'm curious about the you know, the implication of the popularity of the superhero narrative uh, structure. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know whether it is kind of a reflection of the, maybe a contradiction to our mundane life, or mm. a reflection of the lack of value or mm. meaning. Because it kind of the create of the super powerful ego mm -hmm. self, uh, kind of, encourage us to focus more on becoming rather than mm -hmm. being. So, I feel like that's a, a really fascinating question. I don't know exactly what the, ta the terrain is. It's something in the realm of like anthropological, uh, uh, I don't know, there's some, I don't feel like I'm, I have the empirical knowledge or the exactly the skills to, you know, um, the theoretical skills to really grapple with that question. I feel like I helped to set it up, but now, you know, some other people should like help it. But I guess the one thing I would say is that, so I've been, I was emphasizing the like cultural contingency of these particular 
you know, templates, and I was emphasizing like the romantic, the modern romantic hero. Um, but the, hero, the idea of the hero's journey and the idea of a hero, I mean, that's something we find across many, many um, myths and cultures, right? Not all, but many, right? So like Gilgamesh is the story of a hero uh, who is like, you know, he's just like raging to be heroic. All he wants is to do a big deeds. It doesn't matter what it is. He ends up like cutting down a whole damn forest because he just so he can do something big, you know? And my children are like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, my, my daughter, she's 10, and she was like, Mama, I haven't done anything big yet. I'm like, you're 10. It's fine, you know? You don't even have to be being toward doing something big. Just, like, enjoy, you know? Um, I said, my son said, like, um, he's 14. He said, um, oh, this is terrible. This is being recorded, and they're going to be really <laughs> mad at me. But um, he said, like, I don't care what it is. I don't care, like, I just want my name in stone, on a stone wall. Like, <laughs> like it, you know, it could be one footnote among, it just it has to be in stone, you know? And uh, I was like, well, but what if you, like, saved a thousand acres? You were responsible for, like, a great deed that did something and, like, tipped the balance in, you know, global warming or whatever, but nobody knew. He was like, no, I want the name on the wall, you know? So there is something, so they're, they are products of contemporary, so, um, so sorry, yeah, that was, that was a, uh, so this, the, the need to have this kind of quest of like being special in some way, and I think that that is a, a common and not just, it's not just the vacuousness of our contemporary capitalist like regime that's, you know, whatever, that, I take it that superhero stories are echoing and amplifying and putting into contemporary cultural terms uh, uh, mythological structures that have been prevalent for many, many, many generations across many cultures, but again, not all cultures in the same way. Yeah. Um, so do you think we can actually sort of escape the practice of telling stories to ourselves? Right, no. So for some of the reasons I was saying here, like we do act in time uh, we do live in time. We are agents, right? And so, uh, and so I neither think we can nor that we should. Um, the thing that I really worry about is the one totalizing story as the one value giver, right? So the idea that there is, there is, and that's in all, I'm just gonna go back to it. Like you might think I've created a straw man at this point because it sounds so strong. But if you go back, I mean, that is what these guys are all saying, right? They're talking about a story, which is us. We are our narrative. And the value of the narrative is, you know, the, of the self is in that, given by that story, right? So it's not just that we understand ourselves by telling stories to ourselves and each other, which is what I think what Bruner means a lot of the time, but he says the stronger thing. It's not just that, so it's, it's, a, it's not just a claim about understanding, it's a claim about constitution, it's what makes us who we are, is the story. And it's not just a claim about stories, but a claim about the story, the one's life story, right? And that, I want you to see both like why you would get there, like why that strong thing seems like an outgrowth of the things we really do need stories for, and also why it's too strong, right? So I, yeah, I wanna celebrate like stories as things we tell to make sense of ourselves. It just shouldn't be the one story is the only way of making sense. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just to clarify your view then, so are you suggesting that by you know, adopting these other frames, perhaps the metaphors and all these things, we are training ourselves to be better storytellers. Not necessarily. We might, it might happen, but it also we might be making meaning in other kinds of ways, right? So that's another, it's not like the, because I think to say that would be to come back to, to, in, to retain an assumption that narrative is the meaning making, some, the privileged meaning making, like, enterprise, and I don't want to say that. The, uh, one other thing I just wanted to say, and I tried to, you know, in the interest of time, edit this out, but I also think, like, we can use stories 
in a kind of metaphorical way, in a kind of double, uh, uh, this kind of twofold way. So Arthur Danto talks about uh, artworks becoming metaphors for life and life becoming transfigured in light of that. So I could understand my life in terms of Anna Karenina, for instance, right? Um, or I could tell a story about myself, which I know is not true, a just so story, right? Um, uh, it's as if, there's a poem by William Stafford, he says, you know, uh, a story that could be true, like you were an orphan and you were given away and at birth and somewhere your parents are looking for you and you are on a street corner uh, and it's raining and you've lost the way and somewhere, you know, and, and so when they whisper to you, who are you really? You say, maybe I'm a king, right? So that's, sorry about the mangling of the poem, but like, not even, but uh, so not even the poem. But so there's a way in which he's telling a story but it's told like overtly as a myth, as something which is not true. And so it has a, that kind of doubleness, that kind of not fully gripping, you know what I mean? Not, not locking you in in that imprisoned way. Um, so I don't even want to hate on stories even to that degree, right? But it's not the only thing. It's the relation to it and that it's not the only way of making meaning. Yeah, right at the back. I like mentioned a lot of um, famous pieces of literature and sort of the difference between telling stories and I guess writing stories. Yeah. Do you think stories change when we write them down and they become sort of permanent? Um, and if so, what does that mean for how we create ourselves? That's a great question. So, so this book by John Niles called Homo Narans uh, is, uh, for instance, that's about oral literature, right? Um, and there are certain constraints that are going to come in virtue of being oral. Like, you know, Homer has these, uh, these epita epitaphs, that, you know, these phrases that are being used over and over. So, you know, gray-eyed Athena or cunning Odysseus or whatever. Some of that is um, just to, like, remember so you can tell the story that goes over all this time. Um, uh, but there might be, I think there might be, there's a thought that there was a relation to the story as flexible and as responsive to the telling, the context of the telling. So a storyteller, you know, one might think, some people think that in a traditional culture um, in which storytelling as an of oral art, part of what was the task of the storyteller was to modulate the story so it was appropriate to the particular context in which it was being told. And so that would give the story even if it was told it was part of our culture heritage and it's being told over and over again, that would mean that part of its task was to be responsive to the particular context in a way that is, again, exactly not this ossified, imprisoned, like overly rigidified thing, which is what I'm worried about. Um, so that, thinking about that would be really, is cool. Um, uh, but at the same time, what we, I want to emphasize that what we get from frames whether they're written down or not, is a kind of stability, a kind of thing like a touchstone you can take from context to context. And that's really important for them to providing that function. They call us back to a stable mode of interpretation. And so that's also something we see in the oral tales, right? They have certain constraints that have to be met across all tellings. Um, so, and to that extent, they might also seem inevitable and, you know, whatever. So I think it's an interesting question to think more about. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask about the thing you know, the importance of changing narrative structures. So, I mean, on the other hand, you can argue that I can subscribe to one specific narrative structure and then I can express my own values and opinions within that specific narrative structure. So, for example, I could really like Harry Potter books and I could you know, really value Harry Potter, but then, you know, if my Right, good. Okay, so as I understand it, you're asking a question about like, I am all worried about the risk of ossification, like getting stuck in a particular interpretation of oneself and one's life in virtue of a particular narrative. And you're, I hear you as suggesting that there are two ways you could break that. One is by breaking that whole, breaking with that whole narrative 
and the other is by shifting one's relationship within the, like, the narrative world or something. So and being like, you know what? I always thought that it was Hermione who was really important, but now I see that Ron is the one who holds it all together and we should all, you know, whatever. And really, Ron is really, he should be a Hufflepuff. And so, like, you know, whatever. I've realized that, you know. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, that is, and to the extent, and maybe that's a version of when I said something like, your story is not fully written. There are multiple relations you could have among, like I talked about author, narrator, and character. But one thing you might do when you're, it's, okay, this is the thing I really should say, is what you're talking about there is this thing I was just saying about using a story as a metaphor for your life, right? So you're, I'm not talking about your story directly. I'm ta you're using Harry Potter as a frame for constructing a story, you know, and so, um, that already has this kind of doubleness in it, which is, opposed, which is different from just being like, here is the story of my life. And that opens up the possibility of these different relations, uh, prioritizations and structures uh, within that same narrative. So yeah, I think that's right. But notice that if you're telling the story from the point of view of Hermione or um, you know, uh, um, Neville, like those are pretty different stories, right? And uh, they're going to focus on different things. They're going to have different goals. They're going to even within the same sequence of events, right? So there is an important difference in the narrative structure, even though there's even if we're holding the the events fixed. And uh, yeah, the, so that's the way in shift, which shifting point of view can be really you know, powerful. Okay, one 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 more. Make it make it brief. Um, I don't know how to say this properly, but do you think that maybe the rise of artificial intelligence and all that sort of stuff in chatbots yeah. is a way for us to escape stories Ooh. and then get to truth quicker? <laughs> because we're constantly bombarded by stories, like in the modern world, yeah. constantly yeah. consuming media. Yeah. Maybe we want to escape stories. I would think, on the contrary. It will just, so, you know, what I've, one of the things that I was talking about was the way in which we are sort of, you know, understanding ourselves, digesting ourselves in terms that are already given to us by our cultural sort of affordances, right? Our cultural heritage. And you might think of like ChatGPT as just like speeding up that digestion. It's like adding enzymes to the digestive process, right? So it's just feeding, I mean, you know, um, so like my daughter fed into, uh, um, uh, ChatGPT write a song in the style of Taylor Swift, and like it did a really good job, right? Um, and so, partly what it's picking up on are exactly these kinds of patterns and structures and whatever that it that we might not notice are part of the the templates, but it's sensitive to these kinds of patterns, and so it's picking up on it. And so, I would think that to the extent that that kind of stuff becomes that, that the, those modes of generation become more prevalent. What they exactly do is recycle the patterns and mimic those patterns, and so that's going to end up, I think, amplifying this. Um, now, they'll also it'll throw some crazy stuff out. You know, I mean, like it'll throw up some really interesting, wild, and you know, you see this in some of the imagistic constructions. You know, like Dali. Um, so that's. I mean, it's, I'm not saying you know it will only lead to more imprisonment, but. Um, but I think that way in which it's feeding on its cultural resource, uh, already existing cultural resources, is going to amplify that. So, that's, but that's a really cool thing to think about. So I'm afraid we're out of time. Let's thank Liz very much for a great paper. That was super fun. Thank you.